Okay, right, well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Paul. It's very nice to have the opportunity to uh, speak uh, to you tonight. Um, Paul has just introduced us, but uh, I'm Dan, and this is uh, Stephen, uh, my esteemed colleague. Uh, Stephen will be uh, saying a few words um, as well as part of this presentation. Um, so, we're going to talk a little bit about addressing uh, tonight, specifically uh, postal addressing. Why are we talking about addressing? Uh, you may be thinking, well, as you will find out uh, in just a few moments, it is a truly riveting subject, um, but it also uh, just so happens that uh, our day job um, involves developing addressing solutions for uh, a variety of organizations through our company, Allies Computing. So, if I can get this to work. This is, uh, this is who we are. And uh, this is some of our team. And our bread and butter is really doing neat stuff with um, address and location data. We work with a variety of data providers, uh, some of them in this country, uh, some of them around the world. And we take their data and bring it into our fold. And on top of that data, we develop and supply address validation solutions. So um, this isn't a sales pitch, don't worry, uh, but I will just give you a quick rundown of what we, on what we do. So Postcoder Web is our web API, which provides address validation, so address lookup, postcode lookup, uh, geocoding. Uh, Postcoder, uh, Postcoder Batch is our package for um, address cleansing, um, so uh, cleansing batches of addresses if you've got a, a customer database with a few thousand or a few million records, um, it can work its way through that rather quickly. And then we also um, provide address data uh, for those customers that prefer to work with data rather than some sort of solution. This is our office. Um, this, is, uh, this is how it looked about 15 years ago. Um, it, is a, it is a converted cow barn. Um, it now looks rather more like this, fortunately. Uh, we're based in uh, Framingham Pigot. Uh, now, I'm always intrigued to know, does anyone know where Framingham Pigot is? Okay, all right, well, that's, uh, that, that's impressive. That was more than I was expecting. Um, we are, well, for those of you that don't know, we are, we're just south of Norwich, uh, fairly close to Pouring Land, uh, and also Brastids. People seem to know where Brastids is. Um, did you get married? No, I'm married to okay, okay, not so away. not not too far away. I do I do know someone that was married uh, at Brastids. Um, Paul, in fact, uh, came out to uh, to see us. Um, at the, I'm going to get my own back, uh, by the way. Now, okay, Paul, we were very privileged to have a visit from Paul um, a couple of months back. Uh, he came out to see us. Uh, we had a a good meeting with him. Uh, he was obviously very impressed um, by uh, what he saw at Allies Computing, um, because after the meeting, uh, he tweeted. And uh, he said, I went, to visit, <laughs> I went to visit Allies today. Wow. And uh, there is more. Uh, and I wondered what he was going to say next. Uh, perhaps uh, that Dan is a real top guy, perhaps. Uh, or the, uh, the people at Allies, aren't they superb, fantastic? I've never met such great people. Uh, but no, in fact, he said, wow, what a wonderful location. <laughs> so... You can't have it all, but I would, I would agree, Paul. It is, it is a very nice place. Probably like, I technically failed to send you anything, so I wasn't <laughs> Well, vice versa, vice versa. <laughs> so uh, I'm still trying there. Um, so addressing uh, is a very topical subject at the moment. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the EDP uh, on Tuesday. Did anyone see this, uh, this article about the Norfolk uh, County Council? Uh, they got themselves into hot water. Uh, no pun intended, by the way, um, through sending out letters to uh, telephone boxes and ponds uh, and other such places. And uh, as you might imagine, Royal Mail were not particularly uh, impressed at the prospect of their postal workers trying to find the letterbox in a telephone box. Um, so, interesting story, uh, rather amusing, uh, but it does demonstrate that there are complications sometimes uh, when working with address data. Okay, so uh, that's all of the interesting slides out of the way. On to slightly more mundane matters now. Um, these are the subjects that we are um, planning to cover tonight. Um, I'm going to say a few words to start with, and then I will hand over to Stephen to, uh, uh, to pick it up. 
So, address, validation, uh, two words that pretty well uh, define what it is that we do. And if you're on a website uh, and you are purchasing something perhaps and uh, you need to fill in your address, address validation usually starts with the question, what's your postcode? Uh, and you type in your postcode and you get a list of addresses back, you select an address, it populates the form uh, and you move on. Uh, and I'm sure everyone is very familiar uh, with that. We don't need to go over that anymore. The reason why there is a little bit of interest around address validation, believe it or not, is because it can help in a couple of ways. Um, it can potentially help you improve your address quality, uh, as you might expect. But also, when it comes to forms and form design, it can also improve the, the user experience. So, Having a quick look at address quality first of all, um, address validation can help you capture the right address from the start, um, or if you've already captured an address and it's not particularly good, if you know it's a little bit ropey, it can help you fix that address. It can help you make uh, existing addresses even better. And there are lots of organizations, um, lots of businesses that really rely on accurate address data. Uh, if you're working for an organization that is concerned with delivering post to people's addresses or perhaps uh, people, sending out people, engineers to addresses, it's really important that you've got an accurate address uh, for that purpose. Um, perhaps you are um, credit checking um, potential customers and part, as part of that process you need an accurate address in order to identify where they live. Again, really important that you have accurate data for that process. And with good quality data, these processes suddenly become slightly more efficient, slightly more effective. There's also the potential to reduce the human involvement in those processes. So perhaps if uh, you have fewer customers calling up to complain about where's their parcel, where's their package, it means that you can perhaps reduce the number of people on your customer support team. And in terms of user experience, uh, perhaps no great surprise really, if you've got some sort of address validation widget on your form, uh, it allows you to have fewer fields on your form. Uh, fewer fields mean it's easier to complete the form, uh, which is great for your customers. If you, if you have customers using uh, a form, it means that it's easier for them to complete, it's easier for them to potentially convert. Uh, and likewise, if you have staff using your form, it means that they can do their job more quickly, more efficiently, uh, and they are therefore more productive. So, um, address validation usually starts with uh, some inputs that look a little bit like this, or uh, perhaps something like this. And usually, in the background, um, there is a, a call to a third-party API, perhaps like Postcoder Web, or perhaps to um, an existing solution that's also um, out there in the market. This is, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's, it's a bit small, but this is a typical request to Postcoder um, post Web, so it's just a standard HTTP request, uh, and we're passing in, I think I've got a, da -da, right, we're passing in a postcode NR147PZ, which just happens to be um, our office postcode. Um, and within that request, I'm also requesting uh, three address lines. Uh, and that's telling Postcoder Web that I actually want to see the addresses returned back to me split across three address lines because that's the number of lines that I have on my form. So this uh, is an example response from Postcoder Web. We can see here um, this particular address has been split across three address lines, which means that when I come to translate that data onto my form, it's much easier. I don't have to concatenate fields such as building name and street and dependent locality and so on. Now, I mentioned uh, data suppliers, and we work with uh, several of them. In the UK, uh, Royal Mail and Ordnance Survey are probably the two standout address uh, providers for us. From Royal Mail, uh, we get PATH and some other data sets as well. Uh, and from Ordnance Survey, uh, we, we work with Address Based Premium as well as some other data sets. I imagine that most people have heard of PATH. Just a quick sort of nod of the head if you've, or show of hands. Yep, so most people have heard of, of PATH. Address Based Premium, less, less well known. Okay, well, um, that's unfortunate because I'm actually going to be talking more about PATH 
than address-based premium, but uh, perhaps, perhaps another time. Um, so just to keep, uh, to keep the time and to keep this uh, short but not necessarily slick, um, we're going to talk about Royal Mail and some of the data sets that they are offering. So the first one, uh, PATH, or the postcode address file, uh, this contains every deliverable address in the UK. So this data set is owned and maintained by Royal Mail. Um, it is their operational database, so they use it for the purpose of delivering letters and parcels to people's addresses. The data set contains uh, 29 million addresses, uh, 1.8 million unique postcodes, and on average, there are 15 addresses to one postcode. The data set is updated on a daily basis um, by uh, some of the 80,000 uh, Royal Mail postal workers, uh, and typically they see between three and 5,000 changes every day. So as well as using the PATH data within their own operation, they also license the data to the likes of us as a solution provider so that we can incorporate that PATH data into our products and into our services, and then we can resell them to the likes of you as, as end users. So this uh, generates another revenue stream for Royal Mail. Uh, they, they, they earn several million pounds a year through this, through this method. Uh, and every month, we pay them royalties uh, that cover the usage of the, PATH, uh, of the PATH data from our customers. So we pay Royal Mail uh, a load of money every month based on how much our customers have been using PATH. Uh, and this is not an entirely selfless act. We do recharge our customers uh, and incorporate those, those royalty fees within our prices. So, uh, the, so the PATH database contains every uh, deliverable address uh, within the UK. What happens if Royal Mail don't actually deliver directly to your address? Uh, so what happens if you live in a place like this? Perhaps you live on the 13th floor in flat 20, but you never see a postman or woman uh, because they deliver right uh, at the shared letterbox at the, uh, the ground floor entrance. As far as PATH is concerned, uh, the only address that they're aware of is Norvik Heights in Norwich, which incidentally is a fictitious address, just in case you're wondering. So PATH only knows about the address that is deliverable. Um, but, that, but that's not ideal if you're a resident in, in, a, in a block like this. So the best possible address that you can get out of PATH is something like Norvik Heights in Norwich. But when, what you really want is something that looks a little bit more like this. Uh, as a resident living in that block of flats, if you're ordering something online, uh, you don't necessarily want to be shown that when you do look up for your postcode. It would be much easier to see something like that so that you don't have to finish off uh, the details within the address. So is there any way that we can go from that to that? Well, yes, there is. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be talking about it. Um, the solution is multiple residents. Uh, and again, quick nod of the head or, or show of hands. Has anyone heard of multiple residents? This is all quite useful from my perspective. Okay, two allies people have, one non-allies person. Okay, we should have three allies people with their hands up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, so multiple residents, yeah. So this is another supplementary data set offered by Royal Mail. Um, it's owned by Royal Mail, it's maintained by them, and it's licensed by them in, in the same way as PATH. Um, it provides uh, an additional 650,000 addresses, uh, and it defines those dwellings, we can't necessarily call them addresses, uh, but dwellings that sit behind a shared letterbox. Uh, so blocks of flats, uh, university halls of residence, for, in, uh, for, uh, for example. So 650,000 uh, additional addresses uh, in comparison with the 29 million that are in PATH, uh, so obviously multiple residence is not as big as PATH, you wouldn't expect it to be, but it is a significant number, uh, particularly if your customers uh, are living in blocks of, blocks of flats. As a solution provider, um, our message is that if you want a comprehensive view of UK addressing, 
uh, you really need to be combining path with multiple residents. Uh, and that's exactly what we've done within Postcoder Web uh, our API. So, address validation, a uh, familiar slide. Uh, it has the potential to improve um, address quality and user experience, yet we got that. Okay, not always. Um, it's not enough just to simply plonk an address validation widget onto your form and, and hope for the best. Uh, you need to take a little bit of care um, about the way in which you do this, and, and Stephen will come on to talk a bit more about this in a moment. Uh, but I've got an example here, and I don't know if you can, if you can make it out, um, but uh, this is a real-life example. Um, I was uh, ordering something the other day, um, and uh, I was on this website. We've, we've hidden the identity, so... Uh, in order to protect the innocent. Um, it's not one of our customers, incidentally. Um, but I've started to fill in the form here, uh, prompted for the postcode, which I duly entered. Uh, and we get back a list of addresses. So far, so good. I select one of those addresses, uh, which happens to be my own address. Uh, and we have blurred it out, just because I know this is being videoed. And I'm not quite sure who's going to be watching this on YouTube in six months' time. Uh, probably no one, but uh, <laughs> we're, we'll see. So, um, so I've selected my address, so that's all populated. Uh, all of the other details are all fine, so scroll down, click on the Save and Continue button, and bam, we get uh, a rather unfortunate error message. Well, we get two error messages, in fact. Uh, the first one telling me that I need to enter less than 25 characters, um, or 25 or less, uh, and we've got this rather ugly, um, sort of unhandled exception uh, at the end of the page. Um, so in terms of user experience, this ain't great. Um, and uh, it just demonstrates again that there are a few things that you need to be aware of when implementing uh, things like address validation. And that allows me to segue rather neatly and hand over to uh, Stephen, and uh, he's going to give you some tips uh, to consider when capturing addresses. Why is DIS another case? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, yeah. DIS, well, it's it, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it's because uh, in Brunel's uh, post address formatting uh, guidelines, they they do ask for a mailing address for the post town to be another case. Uh, on the they have a, a product, sorry, a guidebook called the Path Digest. And uh, if you uh, have a look at that, which you can, anybody can get at it from a Royal Mail's website, um, any examples that they give, they've, they've all got post town in another case. Um, basically, it's to help with mail routing. Uh, back before you had uh, mass amounts of uh, typed addresses, uh, they relied on the, the post town being easy to pick out uh, on, a, on an envelope. So as long as it got to the right town, it was OK? Uh, pretty, pretty much. Once it, once it got into the town, it would get into the mailing centre. Right. Uh, and uh, away they'd go once it was in the, in the main sorting office. Um, but I'm going to uh, just uh, give you a, a few hints and tips. Uh, I've... I've been working with address data now for 15 years, uh, so I've seen quite a lot of uh, areas where uh, this can all go horribly wrong. Uh, one of the, the classics here, uh, this is the, the longest address uh, on, on PATH, uh, current as of uh, today's data. Um, and if what you, what you will find with, with this particular address, you've got lots of different elements to the address, which you can end up missing out uh, if you just use a standard three-line address form, uh, particularly if you don't pay close attention to all the premise level elements, uh, because what you will miss out is Department for Environment, Food, Rural Affairs, DEFRA, which is the organisation, then you've got a Department of State Veterinary Service. People often miss out the department from the, from the address on PATH. Then you've got a uh, building name and a sub-building name uh, all, all sat there. 
if you're not handling all those elements uh, in your, your address form, you're going to uh, end up with an incomplete uh, postal address. And if you are taking uh, discounts because you're using mail sort or uh, one of these bulk mail discounting schemes from Raw Mail, uh, they will penalise very heavily uh, for incomplete addresses. Uh, so there's your longest one. Now for your shortest one. Again, <laughs> as of today. The reason for this one uh, is that a lot of local authorities tend to put unadopted streets in the building name field rather than in the main street field. And unfortunately for the resident of 249 uh, at that postcode, uh, when their premise information was put in, they didn't put the street into the, the building name field. So you end up with this delightful postally correct address of 249 Brora KW96NG. Fortunately, Brora being just a tiny little hamlet on Orkney, uh, it's probably not a major problem for them. But uh, nevertheless, for people who are dealing with address forms, it's really important that you you look at your uh, field lengths and your uh, mandatory uh, required fields very carefully. If you were to take, uh, for instance, address line one, it is absolutely correct that on address line one, you just have 249 Brora. And the post town, if it's a required field, uh, would then uh, fail on you. However, the post town is actually a postally required field according to Raw Mail. So what you might be better off uh, looking at doing there is mandating within your call to uh, a, a web service such as ours uh, to say that you want the post town to always appear uh, as a specific element and then you can just drop that uh, straight into your, your form. But these... As I say, these are they're edge cases, but they're things that, if they're not being handled properly, if you're trying to take advantage of Raw Mail's big discounting schemes uh, in particular, you can run into horrendous problems and also end up with, with customers getting very irritated because they can't use your, your form properly for, for whatever reason. Another... Interesting bit of trivia for you here. How many of you think, uh, and I've, I've now ruined it here, but <laughs> how many people think that you only get one street at a postcode? The answer is you don't. HD75UZ uh, is the, the worst case uh, to handle uh, in, in Britain at the moment. You've got seven streets. Uh, and two additional records with no street information. You've just got the uh, Slowett uh, locality and a post town of Huddersfield uh, to go along with those. They are small user organisations um, and they just haven't been given a street name. But we have a number of products uh, that we, we provide the Postcoder web service will give you a complete list, uh, will return a, an array either in JSON or in XML uh, of every premise level address uh, at the, the postcode. But we, we do have other products that will return the postcode records themselves. And you need to make sure that you iterate properly through your whole uh, array that comes back uh, to make sure you don't miss any any information. If you just say, just give me the first record, that's bound to be the right one, uh, that's um, a recipe for disaster. It's also uh, worthy of note that the, the PATH database itself contains a lot of identifier information about 
uh, properties. So you don't have to rely on uh, if you're going to build up some kind of a, an identifier based on the address, don't just rely on postcode plus premise number because they can change on a regular basis. Royal Mail do provide a unique delivery point reference number, or UDPRN for short, and that is supposed to uh, go along with the lifetime of a, a building. Or a, or a delivery point. So if an organization uh, moves out of a building, another one comes in, the UDPRN is supposed to stay the same, uh, which is obviously very useful for people who are wanting to, to build a, a database uh, based around that. Uh, you will notice that I have used the word supposed. Uh, that is deliberate because we have found instances where that hasn't really uh, happened in quite the way uh, it's, it's intended. The eagle-eyed will have noted that Dan uh, talked about the multiple residence data file and how you can have a delivery point with multiple addresses sat behind it. That does mean that the UDPRN can occur uh, multiple times in an address on path. The way we handle that is that we take the unique multiple residence reference number, which comes from the multiple residence file, and we provide that uh, in your UDPRN uh, field through the web service. So you, you will get uniqueness uh, in, in that way uh, in, in your response. You can also add uh, any fields like that. Uh, there's raw mail used to provide uh, something that they called a, a delivery point suffix, which was a, a three-character uh, field. It was uh, a number, a letter, and then a checksum. That was always the, the form of them. Uh, and that combined with the postcode was the, the way to, uh, to make sure you were unique. But they now use this uh, concept of the UDPRN, and that works a lot better. Uh, in, certainly in, in my experience. So Royal Mail define within the, the uh, Path Digest that I was talking about earlier on that there will be a maximum of 100 delivery points at a postcode record. Uh, you get 15 on, on average, but then along came the multiple residence file uh, and completely blew that out of the water. If you uh, have a look at the University of Warwick uh, at their Coventry campus, uh, CV47AL, uh, if you return the whole lot, you will get 5,800 plus uh, uh, multiple residence records there. So, in order to avoid completely overwhelming uh, your users with data, you might want to consider uh, looking at a concept called paging. Now, this did actually come from uh, a bit of attention to detail, really, uh, to the way Royal Mail license the data. We have to charge a transaction uh, charge for each set of 100 uh, delivery points or multiple residence records that are returned from the service. So to save people uh, money, um, what you could look at doing uh, if you notice that you're going to get an awful lot of records coming back, which is indicated at the bottom of the response uh, from services like ours, uh, then you can go back and say to somebody, can you put a little bit more into the, your address input, please, like a premise and postcode? So make sure you always allow for people to, uh, to actually do things like that, uh, rather than mandating only search on a postcode, uh, because that can cause, cause problems, particularly uh, when you run into multiple residents, where you've got a lot of records uh, like this one. These, incidentally, the, 
paging and adding fields, removing fields, deciding what goes into the, the address lines. They're on the, the interface that Dan showed you earlier. You just add query string parameters uh, for, for each thing that you want uh, to the, the request, and you'll get it coming back in, in the format that you've asked for. Another common assumption that people make, please don't do this, <laughs> you can end up with lots of uh, identifiers for a property appearing on a path record. So this one here, for instance, you've got the wonders of a uh, sub-building name of apartment one. Uh, then you've got building name of the Jamworks. And then street number 49-51. Uh, that's not indicating of a range. It's just that that's how, what the number would be uh, on the, the building itself. Uh, and then, obviously, you've got a dependent street there, um, post town and, and postcode. If you were to just take, uh, as I've seen a lot of people try to do, only the building name or only the street number. And I have seen instances where people have said, is there a street number? Yes. OK, use that. Don't bother with anything else. Uh, is there a street number? No. Uh, OK, there must be a building name then. And it's not necessarily the case at all. And you can then end up losing data. And it, it doesn't look good at all for your user experience. Um, in terms of the multiple residence data file, you can end up getting into some, some interesting uh, matters when you have got a delivery point, uh, because what, you, what you'll get coming back in your, your return is you'll get the, the main delivery point record, and then you'll get the, the multiple residence records uh, coming up underneath that. So always make sure you present your users with a, a list of, of what's come back so that they can choose the, the most appropriate one uh, in, their, in their listing. So um, in terms of the, the form uh, when it's all, all completed, uh, this is something that uh, is based around the, the request that uh, Dan put up earlier on. If I just... Where is it? <laughs> okay, so what we'd, uh, we've just asked uh, in this, this request here uh, just for uh, our postcode here. We've got query string parameter here, lines equals three. So that is giving us those three lines there with everything uh, concatenated up so that you get the complete address uh, minus the post and the postcode uh, fitting into those lines. Then you have the, the elements broken down individually. Based on that, what you can then do, and back I come, through it all. Right. So we provide that summary line uh, just in the, the select address uh, combo box here. Uh, it's one of the, the very useful features of the, the summary line there, or one of the, the most useful uses for it. Uh, then you've got the organization name we put into address one, address two, address three, and so on, all, all populated nicely. And then you're able to say for your defined fields, yes, I want these specific elements which are always guaranteed to be present on path, 
uh, in going into uh, those fields there. That way, you can be sure that your users are getting a, a good user experience. You're also uh, sure that your, the data quality in your database is good. If uh, you then subsequently run a tool like Postcode Batch or something like that on your database, then you can do regular uh, pruning uh, if you end up with, with stale data, uh, which obviously happens to uh, pretty much anybody. Now, how to solve the matter of field lengths? Now, these, uh, d uh, incidentally, do come from the Path Digest uh, itself. Uh, so the post town uh, has a maximum length of 35, postcode maximum length of 8. So for everything else, I always recommend using a 255 character uh, field there because th your chances of actually overflowing that buffer uh, in any particular circumstance, provided you've got three lines, um, is is pretty slim. Uh, if you are trying to put everything into one or two lines, uh, then you will have a problem. Uh, because uh, if you're just using a 255 character string uh, because of the, the length of some of the addresses. Most people get away with these things, uh, but what I would like to uh, challenge everybody with, really, is being good craftsmen and making sure that when you're uh, building up your, your forms and you're, you're designing these things, that it's, it's being done in a way that makes it most likely that you've, you've got good data coming out of it and a good experience for, for everybody trying to use it. Uh, I think that's us. Any questions from anybody for either Dan or, or myself? How complete is the multi-residence data? Because 650,000 compared to... Yep. Yeah. So. It's basically <coughs> the, the problem, in inverted commas, with the multiple residence file is that records will only end up on there when Royal Mail becomes aware of them. Because you've, Royal Mail are aware of all the delivery points because they, they understand that. They've got that all, all neatly uh, built into their systems. But what <coughs> ten, so what tends to happen is that property developers will say to Royal Mail, uh, we're building this uh, high-rise block, uh, take the Nine Elms estate, for instance, in, in London. So they'll say to them, we'll have uh, this number of uh, letterboxes down on the ground floor. There will be this number of uh, property of floors, uh, this number of flats on each floor. Raw Mail will then be able to add that data into the multiple residence file, and they are asking developers now to provide them with that information on a routine basis. Councils are also doing it a lot more uh, frequently now. So yes, 650,000 doesn't seem like a, a lot, but uh, from my analysis of the data, which I do on a monthly basis, I can tell you the multiple residence file is growing uh, quite considerably. Uh, over the, the last quarter, I've seen in the region of 30,000 additional uh, uh, addresses ending up in the MR file. Um, this isn't directly related to that, but the last time I used um, PAT files or analyzed PAT files was like 10 years ago when you emailed the PAT file and the DLL. Mm -hmm. right. And the, the one thing I remember was the speed of the matching. So yes. that's like kind of the one takeaway. So you could, for, for context, you can like free search part of an address with a string. Yes. And get back results in less than a second. And I've always wondered how. Um, and that's what I'm how, how that's done? 
Yeah, well, because, yeah. I mean, it wasn't playing in the name, it was like 25 minutes, but still. Yeah, well, uh, basically, we have got uh, some very uh, robust indexing uh, going on with against a proprietary uh, database format, uh, which you would have taken at that, st at that stage. Kind of we uh, exactly, exactly. And what we what we did uh, back then, when you would have been uh, taking it, if we were sending you a DLL and a single file, which would have been called ad.dat. Uh, yes. Uh, well, that uh, that particular structure is it's proprietary uh, to us, and we built it specifically with speed in mind uh, and uh, low memory footprint so that it could handle everything yeah. like that. It was a standard, because like, this was 10 years ago as well. Yes, so yeah. Just, yes. It still performs that fast today, doesn't it? Yes, it does, yeah. It runs on open source stuff as well, so it's C-sharp and there's some market. Mm-hmm. It's catching. Are there any other kind of open source addresses? At the moment, I don't believe Royal Mail have got uh, capacity in their mainframe to actually provide, uh, put in a Unicode address. Uh, however, uh, there's, given the, the way Royal Mail uh, IT uh, upgrades go and so on, it's, I, I wouldn't say it was an impossibility uh, for that to happen, but certainly at the moment, uh, on their with their current uh, mainframe estate, uh, we can be uh, pretty safe that we're not going to be dealing with Unicode. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. <coughs> Anybody else? Yes, One thousand updates a day seems a lot. Where do most of those come from? Right, that comes from uh, Postman um, and going round on their their delivery rounds. Um, also, when businesses uh, make, when, when you get changes of occupancy, uh, there's a team uh, up in Sunderland of uh, 50 Royal Mail staff whose responsibility it is to uh, update and keep PATH up to date uh, with, with those sort of changes. Now, given uh, the, the scale of change that goes on in cities such as London, Birmingham and Manchester, uh, that does account for the vast majority of changes uh, that that we see coming through. Um, Is that like company names then? So that's that's company names. It's also new uh, new builds uh, coming online. Uh, it's uh, new post office box uh, registrations. Uh, so, for instance, if we take Aviva uh, UK Insurance. Uh, with their, their vast array of P.O. boxes on Surrey Street, uh, yeah, it, it really doesn't take them very long to add uh, uh, several P.O. boxes for uh, you know, the different mailings that they, they put out on a regular basis. Um, so is this a, uh, do you just purely do UK addresses? Because as I discovered last week, it's actually quite hard to even recognise them. Yeah, we um, we do have services that uh, deal with international addressing. Uh, however, uh, they uh, one thing to um, point out uh, for the uh, for the wary in particular is that the postal address database uh, that is the most comprehensive and the most granular in the world is that of the UK. Uh, Royal Mail are, if you'll excuse the pun, streets ahead of uh, uh, you know, the vast majority of other postal authorities, the, the United States included, uh, in terms of the, the granularity of their coverage. So uh, what that can mean is that when you're trying to find addresses in Spain, for instance, uh, you, yeah, you you won't have the the level of coverage in villages uh, that you, you might logically expect, having become used to the the level of data in the UK. Should we leave it there?
Okay. Thank you very much, everyone.